Good evening. I'm Julie Skoski James, Vice President of the Filson Historical Society, and we are so delighted that you could join us this evening for um, our second Zoom lecture. So tonight, it is indeed my pleasure to introduce to you our Dr. Patrick Lewis. Patrick is a scholar in resident at the Filson Historical Society. He is a Trigg County native. He graduated from Transylvania University and holds a PhD in history from the University of Kentucky. He has worked for the National Park Service and the Kentucky Historical Society and has won digital history grants from the National Endowment for Humanities, the National Historical Publications and Records and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Lewis is the author of For Slavery and Union, Benjamin Buckner and Kentucky's Loyalties in the Civil War. It is indeed my pleasure to now turn this over to Patrick and enjoy the lecture. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Julie. I really appreciate the introduction. Uh, thanks also to uh, Scott and about half my Filson colleagues who are on this call um, doing one piece or the other of helping put this, this lecture on. Uh, as Julie mentioned, tonight's talk is drawn from my book for Slavery and Union, which you should see up there on your screen. Uh, published by the University Press of Kentucky, uh, a wonderful state institution for which I am incredibly proud to be the Filson's representative. Uh, support them by ordering a copy uh, if you want more of the Buckner story. We'll see whether you do or not. Um, finally, a note about the, uh, the illustrations that will follow. Uh, I don't have a wartime image of either one of the Buckners, of Ben or Helen. So uh, I've chosen the work of two contemporary artists, George Lambden and Alfred Waud, uh, and I think that they're, uh, the, the pieces I've selected kind of resonate with the themes that, uh, that we'll take the Buckners through tonight. Louisville, October 16th, 1856. Will Miss Helen, if she has no insuperable objection to corresponding with a gentleman, be kind enough to let me hear from her occasionally. And I assure her that any letter she may write will be read with interest and esteemed as a mark of favor. That begins the record of the courtship between Benjamin Forsyth Buckner and Helen Bullitt Martin. The two had been flirting for some time before this at dances and barbecues in and around Winchester, but with Buckner off to law school in Louisville, this was their first time that their courtship had been put to paper. He started well enough, and then, as he often would, Ben put his foot in it. I came to the city on Saturday last and have formed a great many acquaintances, a few of them exceedingly agreeable ones. I think Miss Knight, Miss Martin, Miss Romney, and Miss Sheridan are the most beautiful ladies I ever saw. And indeed, the exquisite loveliness of Miss Sheridan is entirely beyond description. The contour of her form is perfectly faultless, and her face is most radiantly beautiful, while her carriage full of matchless grace cannot fail to inspire the beholder with admiration. The collection of letters in the King Library at UK doesn't have any of Helen's letters to Ben, only his to her. This is an indescribable shame because enough of Helen is echoed in Ben's correspondence to show that she was an exceptional wit, a strong thinker, and every bit the match for this confident young man on the make. So, we don't know if she kindly declined a response to this first letter or sent him a stinging rebuke that he deserved. A month later, he wrote back, chastened. I am exceedingly sorry, Miss Helen, that you have determined not to correspond with me this winter, for I had hoped to receive great pleasure from reading your letters. But as I am entirely unacquainted with the reasons that induce your determination, I must, with this expression of my regrets, bow a silent acquiescence. Voicing a very real concern, Buckner continued, I am fearful that all the Clark girls will marry off while I'm in Louisville. And although I would regret such an occurrence, because it would interfere with some arrangements I might desire to make, still, I think that if I should be lucky enough to get an invitation to the wedding, that I would not be wholly inconsolable. Now, it might be kind of us to say that Ben Buckner was lucky to come off only slightly wounded in this first encounter, yet he would put himself on the line time and again for Helen Martin. In time, as Kentucky tore itself apart, Buckner would step out onto the battlefield, staking his reputation, his honor, his political principles, and his life to win the admiration and hand of Helen Martin. Yet that is a tired Civil War story. 
What makes Ben and Helen fascinating is something that only Kentucky can provide. He stepped out onto the battlefield in 1861, wearing the blue uniform of the United States Army, to win the hand of a Spitfire rebel and earn the respect of her powerful secessionist parents. Their story lets us explore some fascinating themes in Kentucky's Civil War history and draw some important conclusions about what that war meant to our state. Ben got back on track three years later in 1859. It is with great pleasure, I assure you, my dear Helen, that I exercise the privilege of writing you. A letter is to lovers the medium through which they may almost annihilate the space that divides them and through which, though separate, they may hold sweet converse. It draws near together those who are separated. We can almost see the beaming face and sparkling eye and hear the mimic of the voice we so love to hear. Much better. By this time, Ben and Helen had become engaged, but she, and perhaps more importantly, her parents, thought that young Mr. Buckner needed a thorough examination before entering into matrimony. I revolved in my own mind the whole surrounding circumstances of our engagement. I thought of past life and of my future. I estimated, with as little bias as I could, that when assailed through your love for your parents and plied with all the arguments that a fond and dearly beloved mother can use, you would yield in your love for me. Having convinced myself that our engagement could not stand against that amount of parental opposition, I came quickly to the conclusion that the only way ever to win you was to gain your promise to marry me at an early day and to endeavor by all in my power to aid you in overcoming the opposition of your parents. Why this opposition? Helen's family was one of the oldest in the bluegrass. Her father, Dr. Samuel Davis Martin, was born before the state in 1791 and had attended medical lectures at Transylvania during the height of its academic reputation. He was, though, far more than a doctor. Labeled Clark County's Renaissance man by late state historian Thomas D. Clark, Dr. Martin managed a farm on which between 20 and 40 enslaved people raised some of the finest hogs in the nation in addition to milk cows, working oxen, mules, and horses. Ben's family, though, had had a less brilliant history in Clark County. His grandfather, Benjamin Hawes Buckner, came from Virginia to the Bluegrass around 1804 with his three brothers. He eventually settled in Winchester, where he found success in him. A booming economy in 1840 led Benjamin Buckner to invest heavily in a rope walk and, unfortunately, bear the brunt of the loss when the hemp market went bust two years later. The Buckner patriarch sold what he could and moved to Missouri, where land was cheaper. This left Ben's father, Aylett Hawes Buckner, his legal practice to struggle to make ends meet for his young family. A bid to establish a law practice on the frontier in Jacksonville, Illinois in the 1830s was an unmitigated disaster. A Henry Clay disciple in a town split between Kentucky Democrats and anti-slavery New England Whigs, he was the odd man out. Just years after his arrival, Aylett Buckner found himself effectively shut out of local politics and packing his wagon to return home. By the mid-1850s then, when our young Ben began to court Helen, he did so from a position of social and economic disadvantage. He was the son of a respectable but struggling middle-class lawyer whose future family would thrive or starve depending on the success or failure of his practice. Ben had been prepared as well as his father's means had allowed, amounting to a year at the Kentucky Military Institute and attending some law lectures at UofL, but Helen held all the cards during their courtship. Who was this young upstart lawyer with no fortune, whose family had failed so spectacularly 15 years before? Who was this Ben Buckner to seek the hand of the youngest Martin daughter with nothing more than promises and daydreams? As 1861 dawned, Buckner still had yet to win Helen's parents. That a girl raised as you have been should love her parents and feel a deep desire to please them in every respect and especially in the important items of the choice of a companion for life is most natural, he conceded. On the other hand, I know that you have loved me and that your heart is so full of the principle of truth and honesty that you could never consent while you still live to give me up. Now, Helen, I feel that I have but little to offer you. The devotions of my whole nature and the workings of my whole heart can in no wise compensate you for the sacrifice you are about to make. 
I do not offer anything to pay you for such devotion to me. I feel satisfied that I must remain your debtor to the last day of my life. But while truth and honor maintain their supremacy in my nature, so long will I devote my every exertion towards the pleasing task of contributing to your happiness. Fortunately for Ben, events underway in the spring of 1861 would give him an opportunity to prove his commitment to truth and honor. As the nation tore itself apart and war looms, Ben saw that he must act quickly and take as conspicuous a role in the coming conflict as possible. Winning his sweetheart in the ballrooms and parlors of Clark County had proved difficult, so he sought the battlefield. The only problem with Ben's plan was his politics. While the Martins were fully in favor of rebellion, Ben believed that the old Union offered the best hope for Kentucky. Importantly, though, they may have differed on the proper path to take, but both sides in Winchester, and by and large throughout Kentucky, shared the same ultimate goal, defending slavery. Ben was no Lincoln man. While the Confederates thought Lincoln too dangerous to trust in the White House and therefore seceded, Kentucky Unionists like Ben believed that the power of the Constitution could restrain the president as long as Southern congressmen stayed in Washington and continued to defend the rights of slave owners. Ben blamed extremists on both sides, radical Southern secessionists and Northern abolitionists alike, for driving the country and slavery to the brink of ruin. Great God, let us do nothing, cried Governor McGoffin to his Southern brethren. Kentucky is a border state and has suffered more than all of you. Sympathize with her and stand by her and not desert her in her exposed, perilous border position. She has a right to claim that her voice shall be heard and heeded by you. If you secede, the governor concluded, Southern representatives will go out of Congress and leave us at the mercy of a black Republican government. Mr. Lincoln will have no check. He can appoint his cabinet and have it confirmed. Congress will then be Republican and he will be able to pass such laws as he may suggest. The Supreme Court will be powerless to protect us. Tired of fighting the legislative battles that had gone on since the earliest days of the Republic, battles that white Southerners had by and large been winning. The rebels had sought a battlefield of a more literal sort. So, reluctantly, Buckner and thousands of other Kentuckians marched off to war against their rebel cousins. They would crush the rebel dream of independence, return them to the national fold, and get down to the serious business of thwarting the Republican Party's anti-slavery political agenda. But for this to work, Buckner and Kentucky's pro-slavery unionists needed the rebels. Buckner had to kill the rebels, but never hate them. Destroy their nation, but preserve their trust. Crush their armies, but preserve their society. Helen teased Ben about leaving him for someone more to her parents' political liking. If only we had the letter from her that prompted Ben to shoot back that he could understand how she is making herself so agreeable to her bows, Indeed, it requires no imaginative effort for one to call to mind the many enchantments which she dispenses, but over an agreeable secession bow upon whom she opens the full battery of all her charms, she must, unless his heart is more hollow and false than his political creed, win an easy victory. But momentary jealousy aside, Butner's heart belonged to a rebel, even if his hands would fight for Uncle Sam. You know how hard I fought against it and how many bitter reasons there were to spur me on in my resistance. But you also know how complete was my surrender. So complete that in military parlance, you have not thought it necessary to take my parole. Never did a victorious captain march to victory with more pleasure than I take in devoting the every effort of my heart to your service. Ben's first assignment in the Army was in Smithland, Kentucky, at the confluence of the Cumberland and Ohio Rivers near Paducah. And it was there that he best articulated the war he wanted to fight. I have almost wished that you could come hear some of the tales that the Union men here tell of the horrid outrages committed by the secessionists. The property of Union men has been indiscriminately seized. Farmers tell us of having 30 cattle driven off at a time. Others of having every horse and cow taken from them. Others robbed of all their Negroes. In short, every Union man has been plundered of all his movable property. The rebels were playing a dangerous game, it seemed to Ben. 
If they threw off the law and order of the United States to form their own government, where would it stop? Such are a few of the events of secession, but I know, dearest, that I need not write you about politics. Even while Ben disagreed with Helen's politics, he took pains to give her latitude to express her own opinions. For Buckner, Decrying secessionist tyranny, but respecting Helen's voice had domestic implication as he tried to prove his worthiness before her and the Martin family. He was modeling the household he wanted to create after they were married. Rather than rule his home with corrupt absolute authority, Buckner hoped to govern the household by consent rather than dictate and cement his authority with bonds of love rather than those of economic or physical power. They all say here that I'm too lenient in my dealings with those who sympathize with the rebels, but I'm fortified by the conviction that I have no authority to punish people for their opinions. Perhaps also the fact that my little sweetheart is of that political stripe makes me more lenient than I would otherwise be. Now, darling, why did you think it necessary in your letter to make a long apology for talking CSESH to me? Don't you know that I allow you and would not prevent it if I could the fullest latitude of opinion on every subject, I have never and will never desire to do your thinking, deeming you entirely competent to do so for yourself. And besides, I have not the right to control you upon that subject if I had the desire. Now, given the legal and social conventions of the 19th century, of course, Buckner absolutely had the right once those two were married, just as he believed the United States had the right to put down the rebellion with fire and the sword. But he preferred to conduct his war and his household in such a way that neither would come to it. The household in which husbands govern with the input and through the consent of their wives was like the constitutional government of the United States. The federal government, the father, managed a house full of independent dependents, the states, through goodwill and mutual respect rather than through imperial force. Of course, the very fact that the rebellion had occurred proved how difficult such a household could be to manage. Ben acknowledged that problems would inevitably arise under such a system, while at the same time stressing that the family or the nation could settle those problems between themselves. Compromise that kept the household and the country together was preferable to severing those ties through rebellion, divorce, or undignified attempts by the father to assert absolute control. The balance between allowing dissent and assort, asserting authority for both the United States and the future husband, Ben Buckner, was difficult to strike. As afraid of losing Helen as he was of losing the war, Ben half joked, you know, you sometimes jestingly threaten me that you will trade me off for some other sweetheart. And though I don't believe you will do it sure enough, it still is well enough to keep on the good side of you and not ex exercise the authority in advance that I mean to when we get married. You know my sentiments upon the subject of wife management too well to make it necessary to elaborate. The first year of the war couldn't have gone more to Ben's plan. The Union Army won a string of victories. He found personal glory and fame through his battlefield exploits. And the Confederacy looked like it might collapse in the summer of 1862 before Lincoln and the Republicans could make any inroads against slavery in the rebel states or at home in Kentucky. On April 10th, 1862, Ben dashed off a letter on a piece of stationery scavenged from the wreckage of the battlefield of Shiloh. With steamboats filled with wounded men making for hospitals in the rear, this was his first opportunity to get a letter through. Helen likely had a difficult time picking out words in the pale lines, but enough of the letter was legible to convey the most important fact. I made several very narrow escapes and came off entirely unhurt. Details followed. Ben's 20th Kentucky Infantry Regiment arrived on the night between the two days of the fighting, spent hours under artillery fire, and advanced as part of a brigade of Kentucky troops to sweep the rebels from the field. One shell burst so near my head that the concussion knocked my cap off, and I felt the flame of the explosion on my cheek, Ben recalled. He picked up some of the shrapnel that had nearly killed him and eventually mailed it back to Helen. Even before Ben's letters could reach home, though, word of his conduct at Shiloh was winning him another important victory in the Martin household. Reports published in the Louisville Journal and Lexington Observer and Reporter 
led with an account of Ben's conspicuous bravery, the very first name singled out among all the Kentuckians who fought. Never before was the chivalry of Kentucky better represented than on this field, the article concluded. Let other states boast of the patriotism of their sons, yet Kentuckians can point with pride to the field of Shiloh and say truly that their loyalty and prowess were proven there. Even the Martins couldn't ignore Helen's fiance being the lead story in two of the state's most influential newspapers. When the first reports of the battle reached Winchester, Helen's mother personally wrote Ben the letter that he had been waiting on since 1855. Ben wrote back directly to Mrs. Martin, but implored Helen to give my kindest regards to your mother and say to her that the reception of her message containing an assurance that she did not feel unkindly towards me afforded me the greatest pleasure. That was something at least. And Ben was willing to take it. Keeping in mind how closely he thought the cause of the Union and the cause of his engagement were, it is no surprise to hear him think the whole game nearly wrapped up. I am anxious to exchange war with its loud alarms for peace, with my darling to share with me what fortunes may come. I can, with the full certainty of having served my country fearlessly, return to civil life, better prepared to enjoy the quiet and comforts of home than before. If all goes as we wish, how happy we will be. And then we can, with a quiet smile, look back upon these days of trial and troubles and reflect that if they serve no other purpose, they at least gave us a taste of stern and real adversity and have fitted us to enjoy the smooth and placid comfort of domestic life all the more. Darling, you don't know how much I owe you. How very often I think of the unswerving and untiring devotion with which under adverse circumstances you have clung to me. Gloating at both his success and the success of his cause, Ben teased that in 60 days, New Orleans and the whole Mississippi Valley will be in our possession and the Star Spangled Banner will float from the source of the Father of Waters to its mouth. How would you like to make a trip to New Orleans this winter? With his Kentucky Brigade at the head of the advance, noting that the Yankees can't fight like our Kentucky boys, Ben's command drove into northern Mississippi, wresting the rail junction of Corinth from the rebels and threatening to split the Confederacy in two. I believe that for us, a brighter and happier day is dawning and that our happiness so fondly dreamed of and joyously expected is nearer than you suppose. This terrible war can't last long. And when I return, the consciousness of having fearlessly discharged a dangerous and unpleasant duty and your smiles will more than compensate me for all the hardships and privations that I have undergone. Speaking simultaneously of the nation and his relationship, he continued, our union then, though long delayed by adverse circumstances, will be all the more happy because of the cruel and severe test to which our affections have been subjected. It was so close. But just as the rebel army looked bagged, Braxton Bragg slipped out of the trap. He swung around the Union lines and invaded Kentucky in the fall of 1862, destroying Ben's illusion of a quick end of the war. The Perryville campaign ended in defeat for the rebels, but it gave their cause new life. It also gave Abraham Lincoln the justification to issue the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Though it did not affect Kentucky, the writing was on the wall. Kentucky had lost the gamble. They had not defeated the rebellion and reunited the South before the Republicans could act. What would loyal Kentuckians do? Pausing to write his first letter after driving the rebels from the bluegrass, Ben vented his anger at having his political and domestic dreams shattered. You ask me in reference to Lincoln's proclamation. It is a most abominable and infamous document and falsifies all his pledges, both public and private. The Union Kentuckians are not shamefully heeded and by the reason of the want of the president's good faith, which is only equaled by his lack of sense, we find ourselves in arms to maintain doctrines, which if announced 12 months ago, would have driven us all, notwithstanding our loyalty to the Constitution and the Union, into the ranks of the Southern Army. No Kentuckians can have any heart for this contest. We joined a people of the North, a people whom we did not love, to fight the South, 
a people with whom we were connected by ties of relationship, interest, the identity of our hearts and institutions, merely upon principle, and to preserve that constitutional form of government, which was the wonder and admiration of the world. But the president has, by the shake of his pen, taken all that away. And we are now merely fighting to exhaust and ruin both sections of the country. But what are we to do? Where can we go? Ben was devastated and was desperate to preemptively defend his political convictions against the inevitable Martin family second guessing. The people of the South have brought all this upon us and are not worthy of our support, nor can they give us any guarantee of protection or assistance. Suppose Kentucky were to secede now. The ruin, devastation, and slaughter would be visited on our own state and our rivers would soon be red with blood and our plains would be the final resting place of thousands upon thousands of our citizens. And as for slavery, not a vestige of it would remain. What could he do? Where could he go? Home, to Helen. He and dozens of other Kentucky officers tried to resign from the army. His best friend, Charlie Hansen, shot back to one general that he did not feel satisfied to fight in a cause so detrimental to his own interest, or more bluntly, that he would not fight to free his own Negroes. What is to become of Kentucky, Ben agonized? It is impossible to tell. All is dark in her future. We are all opposed to secession and believe that it is no remedy for any of the evils that beset us. At the same time, we are uncompromising in our opposition to the infamous and disgraceful measures originated by the president and his party. All men of decency ought to quit the army if that bill becomes a law. For Ben Buckner, the Union cause had always been a way to prove that he was a man of decency, a worthy husband with a promising future, an honorable gentleman who had risked his life to defend the Constitution and protect the rebels from their own self-destructive tendencies. Ben's cause, ultimately, was protecting the future he promised to Helen in 1856 and 1859. And while that had meant taking up the sword to defend the Union and slavery at one point, it now called for him to return home and fight on other fields to deliver on the promises he made to Helen in a world fundamentally changed by emancipation. So, in April 1863, Buckner resigned from the United States Army. He and Helen married as soon as he made it back to Winchester. Ben's resignation from the Army launched his political life on the home front. An ever stalwart opponent of the Republican Party, Buckner embarked on a long and successful career that, in many ways, was devoted to defending the vision of his and Helen's future that he had dreamed of as a young man. Ben was elected to the state legislature from 1865 to 1867, where he put on a master class in politicking. Buckner challenged the credentials of 11 Republican members and managed to oust nine, setting the stage for the re-election of conservative union hero Garrett Davis of Bourbon County to the U.S. Senate. All this came in a General Assembly term that rejected the 13th Amendment twice for good measure, implemented new black codes along the lines of the state's old slave laws, and brought reinforcements to the Democratic cause by restoring the full voting rights of former rebels. Later, he would lead state militiamen to violently disrupt African-American political organization in Lexington and defended the first disenfranchising poll tax in Southern history before the U.S. Supreme Court. Blue and gray veterans like Buckner and his law partner, former Confederate Colonel W.C.P. Breckinridge, came together to run the Democratic Party in Kentucky. They smoothed over the fissures of war between themselves as business partners and political allies who worked, socialized, and profited together. Their decades of struggle against the verdict of the Civil War and against the Republican Party allowed them to put the passions of the war aside, as Buckner always hoped they would. An elite Kentucky got on with the life it had wanted to live in 1861. The Buckners were, in the words of James Lane Allen, the flowers of the new social order sprung from the very soil of fraternal battlefields, but blooming together as the emblems of an oblivious peace. Who could together lament the past that had been lost when the war naturally fell as a killing frost upon their beautiful old Kentucky? 
Allen and John Fox Jr. found a poetry in their reunion and divided family war stories became a staple of Kentucky's cultural brand in the turn of the century nation. Of course, Kentucky during the last decades of the 19th century was never as placid as Allen Fox or Judge Buckner hoped, though they never stopped pretending. Buckner's distinguished post-war career was everything he had promised Helen it would be. Circuit judge of the district around Lexington, first president of the State Bar Association, builder of the still standing made administration building at UK, first recipient of an honorary doctorate from the university, and a business leader to whom the LNN would lend a personal rail car on request. Retiring eventually to Winchester, the Buckners went home, physically and mentally, into the old blue grass they remembered and loved. Their life of rural ease and recreation stood in stark contrast to the frantic struggles for survival, independence, and respectability that went on all around them. While miners struggled to organize themselves in the coal camps east of Winchester, while railroad workers grumbled at their working conditions in Louisville, while small farmers were ground into failure by falling tobacco prices and rising debt, and while African Americans in Kentucky and elsewhere faced a hardening of segregation laws and lynching, Ben and Helen contented themselves with happy memories and the company of old friends. One of old Judge Buckner's regular hunting and fishing trips was hosted by Confederate veteran C.B. Ecton at his beautiful country home, Glen Avon, and was recalled as one of the most delightful and enjoyable social events of the spring of 1900. After the group of veterans of both sides spent the day reeling in more than 100 fish, a sumptuous and elegant dinner was served in the most hospitable style to a happy combination of guests from whom mirth and wit flowed freely throughout the day. Socializing in comfort at Glen Avon with friends who had fought on both sides of the war, contented and full of the day's catch, surrounded by cooks, grooms, and servants, it was not a stretch to squint hard and make believe the war had never come. Slavery had never fallen. Men who had worn blue and gray were reunited. Here was the life that Ben had always wanted for himself and Helen. This was the dream that had sustained Buckner during the darkest hours of their long engagement and the horrors of war, when he shut out the stern and horrid realities with which I am surrounded and in fancy's glass saw you, dear Helen. This was the Civil War memory that Buckner wanted, not celebrated in courthouse monuments and veterans parades of the lost cause, but a living domestic memory of the world he had fought and failed to save. Had he not fulfilled his promise? Had Helen not been right to bet on the brash young lawyer, even when her parents were wary? Here they were now, lords and ladies of the bluegrass. Together, he and Helen retired into the very castles in the air that Buckner had daydreamed in Corinth in 1862. I will always love you, and you will never cease to love me. And our lives, despite all the obstacles which an envious fate may interpose, will glide away together as smoothly as the current of a placid stream. Thank you very much. And now we'll switch over to questions that you all have in the chat window. Patrick, thank you so much. Uh, so up uh, for our first question, and uh, we'll give time for others to um, engage with the chat function and um, submit their questions. But this first one comes from Emma. Patrick, were Ben's political views as a unionist, but pro-slavery and anti-Lincoln representative of the majority of Kentucky unionists? Yes, certainly of, of Kentucky Unionists. There's, there are a, only a, a slim handful of, of people going into the war who would have considered themselves Republicans in this state. That grows um, from the 1860 election to the 1864 election. The, the popularity of any wartime president is going to increase the support for his party. Um, but even then, Republicans in Kentucky are, are of the most um, conservative stripe when it comes to matters of race especially. And that continues on you know, well throughout the, the rest of the 19th century. Um, so, so overwhelmingly, yes, of union men, um, and probably unionists represent about 
two thirds of Kentucky voters uh, at the outset of the war, though we don't have good public opinion polling <laughs> to establish that for sure. Okay, the uh, next question comes from Matt. Uh, he wants to know what drew you to this family in the first place? Oh, that's a great question. So I, I wanted to write uh, a book about this political movement, about conservative pro-slavery unionists. That's what I wanted to study for my dissertation. Um, and, and as I went across the state and I, I went to, to research archives and libraries um, everywhere and started reading um, these letters, and, and I, I found this voice so compelling and this story, this human narrative to carry that, that story of this political movement um, really too good to pass up. And, and I, started, uh, I started writing and, and I, as I was crafting those chapters, every chapter was gonna start with an anecdote about the Buckners. Um, and then eventually, uh, fortunately, my dissertation advisor, Joanne Mellish, just said, just write a biography. So that's how I ended up here. But actually I came to Buckner, not necessarily um, through the, 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 the wartime politics of his, but I found him in reconstruction. I found him, and I briefly mentioned at the end of the paper here, um, I found him as he was leading state militiamen uh, to, to essentially beat up black voters as they went to the polls in Lexington in 1870 and 71 and through 73 until they established the poll tax. Um, and he's raising battalions of a battalion of militia, mixed infantry and cavalry in Lexington that's made up of both Union and, con and Confederate veterans. Uh, it is this symbol of, of reunion in the name of, of defending an all-white electorate. Um, and, and the only reason that they um, cease doing that is because it gets bad press, the U.S. Army gets called in, and they figure out that poll taxes are a much um, easier way uh, to, to disenfranchise African Americans who are disproportionately poor. Uh, and so he's the one who establishes that precedent before the Supreme Court. So I, I found him there, and I knew he existed. Um, and I knew he was going to be part of the bigger story, but I didn't know he'd be the whole thing. Okay, the next question comes from Elizabeth. Might you speak further about the role of George Prentice and Paul Shipman and the policy of neutrality? Oh, yeah. So Prentice is, is kind of the, uh, if he's, he's the thought leader of, of Kentucky Whigs, I think that's fair to say. He's the one who's writing the Louisville Journal, which is is one of the most nationally circulated uh, newspapers that's representing sort of the strain of, uh, of, of Henry Clay's thought and political movement after Clay is dead and the Whig party is no more. Um, and, and, and what neutrality and, and Prentice is, as one of the leading voices that calls for neutrality um, is able to pull off in Kentucky is stall. There's, there's an excitement as secession starts to happen in, in the spring of 1861, and as everyone sees the, the country moving towards war, and, and, and hot-headed people um, in the South are, are pushing their states to, to go ahead and secede very quickly. Um, and, and there's just not quite enough political support for that idea in Kentucky for it to happen. And, and Governor McGoffin, who I quoted here, though he will become a Confederate sympathizer, um, later on in the war is, 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 is a good constitutionalist uh, and refuses to unilaterally of his own accord lead the state out of the union. He wants a secession convention. Uh, he wants the legislature to do something. And so they wait for uh, a series of legislative elections in the summer of 61 um, and, and those overwhelmingly go um, in the favor of the union party. Um, and then uh, after that, by the, by the fall, by September, they've, they've thrown over the, the period of neutrality and officially declared that Kentucky is a union state. This, of course, also means that there's a break off Confederate government down in Bowling Green um, that we don't really want to talk about right now. We can. Um, but, uh, but no, neutrality is, is, the great, is the great tactic to, to kind of take the secession pot off the boil and, and reduce that pressure and give uh, the, the unionists, the, the, the time to organize for those elections. And they really, they, they win them hands down. And, and that's also complicated by the fact that some of the, the secessionists who are by and large Democrats, um, not entirely, um, but by and large are, um, have already left, have already moved into Tennessee and started ra raising units. Some of them boycott the election, so they don't even have to show up. Uh, but yeah, neutrality is, 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 saves Kentucky for the union. 
Uh, Patrick, this next question is from Tom. Uh, do you know any more about Ben and the Battle of Perryville? He doesn't get there, and he's really sad. It's, it's this great, um, it's, it's the story that he's been waiting for, right? Shiloh was a triumph, and he gets these good write-ups, and, and, and um, you know, they're, they're chasing this rebel army, and they're on the heels of Bragg as they're moving up into Kentucky, and, and we don't have much correspondence from him at this time. He's, he scribbles off some letters when they're just outside of Nashville and says, look, I've got to put my baggage in the wagon, and we got to go. Um, so, so he doesn't have his writing implements with him. Um, and so then it's, it's radio silence until they get back into Tennessee. Um, but like the majority of the Union Army at Perryville, he's around. But the, the effect of the acoustic shadow and the, the, the sound of gunfire bouncing off the hills, um, two thirds of the Union Army doesn't know there's a fight happening. And so they don't move in to engage. And so uh, he doesn't get that, that one grand moment um, uh, in, in, on Kentucky soil, which would have been so meaningful. And then ironically, um, the only major action that the 20th Kentucky has um, in the Perryville campaign is as they're, they're chasing the Confederates out of the state, they're heading off down through Cumberland Gap, and um, they stop in Clay County, and there are some salt works there um, that had, had the Confederates had been moving up from Tennessee and, and, and capturing all that salt that had been made there and using it to preserve meat and things for the rebel army. And so they're ordered to destroy the salt works. And so the, this brigade of Kentucky troops, the first, second, and 20th Kentucky, um, their only major action is to deconstruct a piece of the Kentucky economy. Um, and that salt works had been, one, had been overwhelmingly operated by enslaved labor before then. So, so instead of fighting that one climactic battle, he's actually tearing down the, the physical infrastructure that, that makes slavery possible in this county. And I cannot imagine how sad and dejected they were in this, this rainy, cold mountain afternoon where they're just tearing up these salt pans. Um, David would like to know, this is a two-part question. Uh, did Morgan's various raids and often ugly guerrilla war warfare that ensued in Kentucky after his resignation in 1863 not make him reassess his resignation from the Union service? That's the first part. And then the second part is, what did he do between his resignation and the end of the war? Oh, those are good questions. I don't know, because he goes home and he stops writing things down, because he's there to talk to Helen. <laughs> um, not much. Uh, I think he mostly goes about reestablishing his legal practice. His father was the, the um, circuit court clerk in Clark County. Um, and his father was in bad health. Uh, and so I think he picks up a fair amount of his father's legal practice and kind of starts to right the family ship again. Um, about guerrilla warfare, yes. Um, and, and in fact, Ben tries not to leave the army. He, he does what a lot of Kentucky officers at this time are trying to do. And they're trying to get, um, they're trying to resign their commissions from regiments out in the field and get commissions back in the Kentucky militia at home. So Kentucky is raising state troops, thousands and thousands of them, and, and, and the federal government is not okay with this because they're still not entirely convinced that Kentucky's gonna stay. As late as the spring, summer of 64, Kentucky is still, there is still an outside chance that Kentucky secedes. Um, and so the idea that the state is raising its own soldiers makes Lincoln pretty uncomfortable as it should. And so, uh, Buckner wants to get himself into one of those so he can stay in uniform, right? And so he doesn't have to answer questions about, uh, about why, did, why did you take off your, you know, why'd you, why'd you unbuckle your sword? Um, but he can't get one of those because they're too popular because everybody's trying to get out of the army at the same time that he does. Um, and interestingly, uh, Morgan's increasing raids are going to, to start to cause a, a great deal of trouble. Uh, Buckner almost gets captured on his way home. Um, the one of the last letters I have where he's still in the army, he's stuck in Lexington because he had come to get a marriage license in Lexington because apparently the Clark County courthouse was not functioning. I guess he could ask his dad about that one. Um, and so he had to come to Lexington with the marriage license. Um, but he, he writes this letter and sends it off by, by someone who wasn't in the army that says, look, I hear Morgan is camped out on Winchester Road on the, on the Fayette Clark County line. I ain't leaving. So, and that's only going to increase. Um, and that's going to make 
um, that's going to make those acts of reconciliation in 1865 and 1866 a whole lot tougher to swallow because, you know, the war ends very brutally and violently and, and chaotically, anarchically. Um, and, and trying to reestablish a political community um, in 1865 and 1866 is really, really tense. And fortunately, I think probably because of the experience of his relationship, he's, he's sort of uniquely posed to be this bridge builder in that, that legislative session. Uh, great, Patrick. We have a lot of great questions coming in, so I'll keep going. So Dick asked, uh, before the war, did Buckner weigh in on the issue of emancipation? Was he completely pro-slavery or was he ever in favor of colonization or a gradual emancipation? That's a really good question. They're, the family is, is a Whiggish family and Whigs, Henry Clay being the, the chief Whig, of course, are, are tend to support colonization if anybody is going to. I don't have any direct evidence of that. Uh, the family is, is a slave-owning family. They own uh, a couple of people in Winchester uh, in their household domestic servants. Um, so, but, but again, um, you know, slave owners do support colonization. This is one of the, the, the strange quirks of, of Kentucky ideology in the antebellum era. I don't have any good evidence, but if anybody in the state is most likely to, uh, it would be somebody of their sort of demographic and political persuasion. Okay. Uh, Ronald said, Patrick, this is a great story, and I totally agree. Uh, he wants to know, what, if any, differences of political views between Ben Buckner and Colonel Frank Lane Wolford? Did Buckner change his views as he aged like Wolford? Um, that, that, again, is tough to gauge. Um, I think in that immediate uh, post-emancipation world, and I think I know the Ronald to, to, who asked this question, so, so hi, and, and I'm glad to see Mr. Wolford make, a, make an appearance. Um, they work hand in hand really well together, but they represent two very different strains of the, the Kentucky Democratic Party. Um, Wolford is, is kind of the, the unvarnished raw anger, um, and, and, and a lot of that tinged with some really explicit racism. Um, that, that, that comes out and vents um, as especially Kentuckians who had put their lives on the line for the United States and felt betrayed by that, uh, felt betrayed by the government, um, felt themselves hard done by. Um, Buckner is a, shall we say, a savvier political player than that. Um, I think he, he kind of affects a little bit of bluegrass gentleman in there. Um, and so he's never going to let, he's careful to not let his opinions slip out explicitly. And this is where I think the, the, the poll tax incident is such a, a brilliant um, kind of lens into how he thinks and acts about race and how he is very, very subtle, right? He's there and he's willing for a time to use explicit violence. But as soon as he can find a way, a legal mechanism uh, that doesn't involve um, that, that sort of overt brutality. He's going to choose that option. Um, and, and that seems to be, from, from what I've pieced together of his legal career and sort of public, um, you know, sort of commentary on, on his philosophy as a, as a jurist, um, he writes some things about murder and, 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 and other sorts of sentencing philosophy and that sort of stuff. Um, that seems to be his kind of mantra. He's, he's a good old bourbon Democrat, this, this noblesse oblige, um, that wants to, to I, think, I think, still believe in this metaphor of the entire South as a family, as a, as a black and white family living together with differences, with an unquestioned father um, and an unquestioned hierarchy, but, but one which, in which everyone knows their place. But, but he's really tough to draw out on those things. Okay. Uh, Joseph would like to know, how many children did the Buckners have and what became of them? They had three. Um, a couple of them die fairly early and the one who lives the longest is a girl who never marries. So his direct line dies um, pretty quickly. Uh, he has some very interesting brothers. Um, one of them becomes, uh, is also in the 20th with him. He's, he's kind of the, the little brother tagging along. Uh, and ends up becoming the, the captain of the local company that Ben had first raised in 1861. Um, he's going to become a Republican um, after the war. 
and in the local uh, Grand Army of the Republic, so the Union Veterans Organization chapter is named the DT Buckner chapter um, or post um, of the GAR. So that's, that's very interesting. And then he has another, the youngest brother is, um, is just a teenager when the war breaks out. And in fact, his, their, their father tries to uh, get him sent to West Point just to get him kind of shipped away from, from everything. They can't get him in there because everybody has the same idea. Um, and they send him to medical school in Philadelphia, and then he ends up uh, a surgeon on a U.S. Navy vessel um, in, in, the, in a tax mobile. Um, and then he'll come back to Lexington, um, uh, eventually teach at UK um, for a long time, and, and become sort of a member of, of the pillar of the Lexington social community. So his, and, and, his, and his brothers have children who, who continue on. Um, and I've had a little bit of contact with descendants there, but, but nothing out of the direct line, sadly. Okay. Um, Dennis said, perhaps he missed this, um, but what regiment or unit uh, did Ben serve? 20th Kentucky Infantry um, and, and some really fascinating um, politicking there. It's, it's a regiment that is raised primarily out of the, the inner bluegrass. He um, and, and a guy named Sanders Bruce, who will later become famous as, uh, as a turfman and a newspaper editor, um, one of the founders of the, the, the post-war thoroughbred industry. Um, and, and Charlie Hansen, who I mentioned, um, is a lieutenant colonel and Buckner's the major. Uh, Charlie Hansen's brother is a Confederate general, Roger Hansen, who'll be killed at Stones River. Um, and and it's, a, it's a really curious amalgamation of, of inner bluegrass types. Buckner recruits some guys out of uh, like Estill and Powell counties, um, so a little bit of mountain foothills there, and then they get about mm, two or three companies that are um, a grab bag of men from western Kentucky. So when they're out at Smithland, um, they get a bunch of guys who had been just absolutely smashed by the rebels who had come up um, the, the, the Cumberland and the Tennessee up to, to Columbus, Belmont, and, and Fort Henry and Donaldson, um, and sort of cleaned out all the Union men. And I, I dropped that quote there in the beginning um, of Buckner talking about all the Union men having their property stolen, their slaves stolen to go work on fortifications at Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. And so those guys end up as refugees in Smithland, and the, the 20th needs some more men. And so they, they cram those guys into this, this regiment with these bluegrass gentlemen, and it is, it is an interesting uh, dynamic within that unit. Uh, Jude would like to know, is this Buckner the person for whom Buckner, Kentucky is named? Oh, I don't know. There are a bunch of Buckners. So, um, and, and I always get the question, I'm surprised it's not come up yet. It's probably in the chat already. How is he related to Simon Bolivar, Buckner, the Confederate general and, and later governor? Um, they are what they call Virginia cousins. Um, so they're, they're, most of the Buckners in Virginia come out of Caroline County. Um, they all tend to come over in various waves. Uh, Buckner's immediate um, closest relatives are the Buckners that settle in, uh, in Bourbon County. They are, they are kind of the closest ones. So I, I mentioned three uh, brothers come with Buckner's grandfather, uh, with our Buckner's grandfather, too many of them running around in my sentence. Um, and they settle in, in Clark and Bourbon. Um, and then there are successive waves of others that come and end up in Munfordville, and then the, the set that ends up here and spreads out. That's the one for whom I think Buckner is named, the, the, the ones that come to Louisville first and then go up river. Okay, Patrick, this is the last question for the evening. Uh, was the Clay County Salt Works the one started by Reverend Francis Clark's son? I'm not sure who started them. Um, there are, there's a whole complex of them down there, and, and Dwight Billings wrote a, a fantastic book about these, oh, I don't know how long ago, um, 20, 30 years ago, uh, about, about the use of slavery in the mountains and how that sort of always kind of um, put, put the mountains in, in, on this path to, to sort of economic stunted de dependence and extractive industry. Um, well worth reading, and, and he'll know all the, the details there. I do know there's... Um, uh, another general, a union general uh, named T.T. Garrett, who owns some of them. In fact, I think the ones that the Buckners tear up, or that the 20th tears up, um, and they, uh, he is, he's, uh, again, furious at, at emancipation and the, the turn that the war takes 
um, resigns his commission as well and, and says, you know, if I had known that this was, was going to be the way it ended, I never would have drawn my sword. Um, so it's really ironic that they ended up, you know, they're, they're doing economic damage, not only to, to slavery in the abstract, but to someone who thinks um, just like them as, a, as what was billed as an act of military necessity. Okay, so we're getting a lot of great uh, feedback uh, from everyone about what illuminating talk, what amazing learning opportunity this has provided. A uh, great program, Patrick. Uh, so I echo all of these sentiments and more. Uh, we have a lot of uh, great upcoming lectures that are free on Zoom. And so we are hoping that you help us spread the word about these. This lecture has been recorded so if you had uh, friends that were not able to join us this evening, uh, within a couple of days, we will have this up on our website. And to those of you who registered, we will send you out the link uh, so you can feel free to share uh, with others. And so Patrick, uh, we can't thank you enough. Uh, this was a wonderful presentation and we do thank everyone for, uh, we had a, 70 plus people that joined us this evening. And so uh, we hope that you come back and uh, visit with us frequently. And again, thank you so much, Patrick. Good evening. Absolutely. Uh, if you all have questions that I didn't get to, feel free to email me. My, my email address is on the, the Filson's website. I'll be happy to keep this conversation going.